Oops. What is the story that Matthew is trying to tell in his gospel? For the three Sundays leading up to today, the gospel readings all came from chapter 13 of Matthew, the chapter before today's lesson. Chapter 13 is a long chapter that includes no fewer than eight parables. The parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds among the wheat, the mustard seed, the yeast in the lump, the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl of great price, the net that catches fish of every kind, good and bad, and the master of the household who brings out of his treasury things old and things new. The chapter is sometimes called the Sermon on Parables. And chapter 13 ends with Jesus going to his hometown of Nazareth. And he starts to teach in the synagogue. But the people are offended because they know who Jesus is. They know his family. They know his brothers. They know he's a carpenter's son. And they think to themselves, who does he think he is presuming to teach us in the synagogue? They're offended because Jesus appears to be reaching above his station in life as a carpenter's son and a king well known in the town. They will not have it. And Jesus identifies himself as a prophet who can't be heard in his own country. Then chapter 14. Chapter 14 opens with the grisly story of King Herod beheading John the Baptist, tricked into it by Herodias's mother. And that's immediately followed by the opening words of today's gospel passage. When Jesus heard it, he withdrew from there to a deserted place. It's understandable, isn't it, that Jesus withdraws? He withdraws from Nazareth because he can't be himself there. The people take offence and are scandalised by what he says, thinking he's getting above himself. He withdraws from a setting that's all tied up and determined by social status and conformity with set expectations. He can't do anything there because of their unbelief. And he withdraws when he hears about Herod's brutality. He withdraws from the brutality of the Roman Empire and its puppet governors. He can't do his work entangled in the tentacles of Rome's brutish military might. It's as if Jesus is looking for space, a new arena in which he can speak and teach and work. It's as if he can't breathe in his hometown or in the cauldron of Rome. He needs air. He needs oxygen, a different environment, space out from under all that. So he withdraws to the desert. And the crowds follow him. They crave him. They can't get enough of him. Why? Well, they want that oxygen too. Jesus had compassion for them. And he cured their sick. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And he cared for them. When evening draws on, the disciples get worried because the crowd will be hungry and they have nothing to feed them but five loaves and two fish. Send them away to buy food, they say. But Jesus' compassion shines through. He says they need not go away. You give them something to eat. This tells us something about Jesus and something about what being a disciple of Jesus involves. Acting compassionately, concretely, doing something about human need. That's the heart of who Jesus is, and that's what he expects of his disciples too. You give them something to eat. We have nothing, they say, but five loaves and two fish. 
Jesus takes the five loaves and two fish, looks up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. All ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets of leftovers. In the desert, compassion drives Jesus to serve the weak by feeding them. And this is nothing less than God's kingdom breaking into their reality and doing so abundantly. It seems to be so little, but all are fed universal, all-inclusive, abundant. This experience of the kingdom manifesting itself is right in line with everything that all those parables said back in chapter 13. God achieves God's purposes unexpectedly, surprisingly, abundantly, even when Remember the parables? Even when much of the seed that's sown is wasted and produces nothing. Even when mustard seeds spring up from the seeds of weeds spoiling the crop. Even when the pinch of lemon seems so minuscule compared to the size of the lump of dough. Even when weeds spring up in the middle of the wheat. Even when the good fish have to be picked out from in the midst of the bad, even when those invited to the banquet refuse to come. God achieves God's purposes abundantly, despite all these apparently insurmountable obstacles and setbacks. In the end, the harvest is abundant. The whole lump of dough rises. The banquet is filled to overflowing with those unexpectedly brought in from the highways and the byways. 5,000 are fed, and there are 12 baskets of leftovers. In the new atmosphere of the desert, free from Roman military control and accustomed social and cultural constraints, Jesus is free to respond to human need with compassion. People are cured, fed, taught the truth, nourished. They experience peace of mind. This is the only miracle story that appears in all four of the Gospels. That tells you that it meant a great deal to the early church in all of its diverse communities. Scholars think that this story was told at the Eucharist understandably, because Jesus' actions in the story, taking bread, giving thanks, breaking, and giving, are the same fourfold actions of the Eucharist itself. We take bread at the offertory, give thanks to God for it in the great thanksgiving prayer, break the bread at the fraction, and give it to everyone present. And the Christ we meet in the Eucharist is food enough, more than enough. It's health, truth, nourishment, peace of mind. It's the gospel. God is love. To follow Christ is to trust God and express faith in concrete acts of love and justice and compassion. It's to be God's power for good in the world. It's to go and heal and reconcile and forgive. To bring truth, nourishment and peace of mind to all. This is the atmosphere in which we can all thrive. This is oxygen for the world. This is food enough. Food abundant. Christ gives it to us, his disciples, to give to all. And did you notice?
said in his first, probably first ever Eucharist, they didn't have wine. <laughs>